Hey, everybody. Before we jump into today's episode, I just want to point out a few ways in which you can work with us here at How to SaaS. Number one, if you're an investor and you're in the middle of a transaction and you want to figure out what is the marketing potential of the target investment that I'm looking at, you can engage with us in a due diligence engagement where within two weeks, we can give you a very clear picture of all the levers within the marketing function of that organization and how you can scale budget up and down and find efficiencies and make the overall marketing function far more mature. Number two, if you're a founder, a CEO, an operator, or even an, an investor, and you have a company where marketing is just under leveraged and you see it as a growth lever for your business to take it to the next level, you can engage with us in a three to four month engagement where we do a deep dive and look at all the possible areas where marketing can make a bigger impact on the organization and come back with a detailed set of recommendations across demand gen, paid media, ABM, uh, content marketing, product marketing, SEO, you name it and come back with a full set of recommendations, your entire new org design to support those recommendations and overall budget recommendations for the business. And number three, if you have a particular business where maybe your VP of marketing was recently transitioned out, maybe they left for another job, maybe you don't have a CMO but are thinking about hiring one, well, we can fill that gap within your organization with part-time CMO services. And we do this on a month to month retainer, which can last anywhere between three months to 12 months, depending on what your needs are. And we can help set the foundation for the company and help you hire your next CMO and help onboard them into the role so that when they come in, into the organization, they get a running start and they're able to make an impact on revenue right away. And you don't have to wait to find the right person to get going with all your marketing initiatives. So those are all the ways. If you want to learn more, go to www.hattasass.com and schedule a consult and we can go from there. And now on to the episode. Enjoy the show. Welcome to the Private Equity Value Creation Podcast, where we interview leading investors, operators, bankers, and advisors to help you answer one question. How do we increase the enterprise value of our companies? My name is Shiv Narayanan, and each episode, I will dive deep with a guest to help you become a better value creator and capital allocator. So with that said, let's jump right in and let's get started with today's episode. My guest today is Matt Gallagher, and he is the portfolio CRO at HG Capital, which is one of the largest private equity firms in the world. In fact, it's one of the top three firms in Europe in terms of private equity investors. And what's interesting about the conversation with Matt is that HG has some really thought through and built out playbooks for optimizing and growing their portfolio companies. And Matt has a very unique perspective on the sales side to make sure that the companies are ready from a new logos, expansion, cross-sell and upsell standpoint. And so he talks a lot about how to get your sales team prepared and ready to sell, how do you make sure segmentation and coverage is in order, how to make sure that the sales team is enabled with the right uh, content and resources so that they're set up for success. And also, how do we figure out the right budget and, and targets for that sales team and have the right kind of expectations from the sales organization. Uh, and we also obviously, because we're out of SaaS and marketing is our focus, we spent some time talking about marketing's connection to sales and how we can ensure that marketing is doing its part to help sales hit its target. So it's a really great conversation from one of the biggest investors in the world. And so I hope you have some great takeaways for your company and your portfolio. Enjoy the episode. Hey, Matt, how's it going? Welcome to the show. Hey, Jeff, thank you for having me. Excited to have you on. Obviously, we've done work with HG companies and HG is one of the biggest investors in the world. So uh, excited for the audience to learn from you and all the things that you, the firm and you yourself and your role are up to. Of course. Thank you for having me. Happy to share. Yeah. And, and so why don't we start with your specific mandate and, and a background about HG for the audience and, and then we'll go from there. Sure. So uh, HG, just real high level, we're one of the most active software and technology investors in the world. We're the third biggest PE firm overall in Europe. Um, and overall, we've got about 300 employees across five offices, London, Munich, Paris, New York, and San Fran. We're managing funds around $40 billion. Um, and our funds have been oversubscribed since 2012. That's usually pension funds, insurance companies, endowments, and foundations. Um, We've got 48 companies. I might, I might be off by a company or two. We're always buying and selling. Uh, aggregate value across those of 102 billion. Um, 
the valuations range. You know, the small end would get the Mercury Fund. Uh, those companies might be around 100 million to maybe 500 million in enterprise value. Uh, there's a Genesis, which is the middle, and then the top is Saturn, which is anything over 1.7 billion in enterprise value. And obviously, the Genesis would be anything in between. Got it. And then in your role, is the objective to work with all of these companies across the board to help them create more enterprise value? Why don't we touch a little bit on that? Yeah, so uh, my role is within the portfolio uh, team uh, within HG. And then we've got a team, a growth team uh, as part of that, which is uh, about 10 folks that are across functions like sales, marketing, revenue operations, and pricing. Um, now, given that we've got 10 folks, we've got 48 companies, we can't go deep into all 48. Um, so we, uh, we try to prioritize our time where we spend, but, but a lot of our time is disproportionately spent on the newer companies, the first like, 18 months in whole. Right. And, and so that, that, that's a good area to dive deeper into a little bit. So when you're prioritizing, obviously, you know, first 100 days or the first 12 to 18 months is when the, the table is set for that company to drive value over the whole period for, for, the, for the firm. So I totally get that. But mm -hmm. when you're thinking about the different avenues available, how are you prioritizing between those different initiatives? And is a lot of that figured out during the investment phase when you're figuring out your investment thesis for a particular investment? Yeah, um, you know, the, uh, the, the portfolio team, not just growth, but a number of key functions in the portfolio team are going to partner with the deal team during that due diligence phase. Um, and it's, we're trying to one, be a, uh, a, a lens, an expertise lens, a functional lens into the company. So we've got like a cyber team, for example, always wants to make sure before we buy a company that they're not at risk for some kind of cyber attack. We've got an ESG team. You know, we need to make sure that the company is in line on that end. We've got a legal team, so on and so forth. The growth team uh, that I'm a part of, we're really looking for both risks and upside. Uh, and you know, the ideal situation is where we find a company where we've got great product market fit. But when we look at that, uh, the growth motion, which again might be sales, marketing, partner, customer success, et cetera, is suboptimized. You know, if you've mm -hmm. had good success and you're not using all the best practices, Experience has taught me uh, and, and taught our firm uh, that when you uh, layer on those best practices, you can really supercharge a company that's already performing pretty well. And so which metrics or areas do you look to to figure out the maturity in all these different domains when you're trying to evaluate the particular go to market? And, and a lot of the companies that you're investing in are also larger businesses, right? So they may have more than one product line or more than one business unit. Uh, oftentimes multiple business units. And so even between those, you might have one business unit that's more enterprise go to market and one maybe that's more, more transactional um, in the product that they're selling. So in that type of a complex environment, how are you looking at all the different areas in which you could focus on? And obviously you mentioned there's only 10 of you and there's 48 companies and the sizes are so large. And, and then each of those domains, whether it's marketing, sales, pricing, segmentation, is a is a enterprise in itself, right? So, how are you prioritizing between those? Yeah, so, so uh, you asked a couple of good questions there. One, naturally, when you've got a company that has either different segments um, or different sales motions, or maybe different regions, you may need to break those apart and analyze them uh, in isolation because there may be a different story there. Uh, also, possibly you might have uh, might be the same segment, but maybe very different products you want to analyze separately. Um, but when we're looking at those at, at a very high level, um, one, you want to look at the bookings, right? What's what, what's the, the new business coming in uh, that's different than revenue, right? This is either a new, a new logo, cross-sell, or upsell. Um, then you want to look at efficiency. Okay, so they're booking, but then what cost does it take to get there? Usually that's sales and marketing, but maybe also partner uh, costs that go in to drive that. You want to see a, a, a good ratio there. Um, you know, 0.75 to one is a pretty efficient company. Um, believe it or not, if that efficiency gets too high, that's not necessarily higher isn't necessarily better because at some point you're probably leaving growth on the ground. You're probably leaving money on the table by not investing more if it's too efficient. When, when you uh, say 0.75 to one, which metric was that in reference to? I, I missed uh, that part. Yeah, you might call that the magic number sometimes online or a sales efficiency number. It's just bookings yep. divided by, uh, by all the costs that go into it, sales, marketing, and part. Got it. Um, we also like to look at, uh, if you look at all of the direct salespeople, um, you just want to look at 
you know, what the, uh, what their performance has been. How many of those sellers are uh, at 80% to quota or higher, assuming the goals are set right? Um, you know, the ideal is 80% of the sellers are at 80% or higher. I'll have to admit over the years, I've looked at a lot of companies, a lot that had very good exits and performed very well. I've never seen anybody get to that number. But if you're approaching that, if you've got more than half of your sellers at 80%, you're doing pretty well. Um, you also want to make sure, that, are, are you paying your, your reps uh, the right amount? Usually you're looking for, and that's, you're taking their on-target earnings. That's what would they take home, the base end variable, if they hit their goal at 100%. Uh, so you might call that on-target earnings. And you want to see what is that as a multiple of their quota. I'm sorry, the quota is a multiple of the on-target earnings. Um, and that's just over SaaS businesses over the years, they've learned you want to, you want to see something around four to five X there. Um, you know, again, if it's too high, you may not be paying something competitively. You may not have the right goals, et cetera, et cetera. If it's too low, then uh, that's the other extreme. Um, so those are just a, an example of some of the core metrics that we that we like to look at. But really, to get a picture of a sales team, you've got to you've got to go a layer deeper, and it just varies by a company. Uh, which so so let's start with the yeah, let's start with the efficiency piece because in in a way, that's looking at your payback period and all your acquisition costs, sales, marketing, and everything else in between. So when you find a company that's inefficient on that, let's say they're, they're either overspending or, or they're taking too long to break even, or maybe they're too efficient, what steps do you take to get them to that you know, efficient frontier that an organization should be at? Yeah, so let's maybe use two different examples. Let's say we've got one where they're growing, and then you see that it's, it's inefficient growth. Um, one, the one thing I'm going to look at is the, uh, is the role definitions that they have. I mean, who are the different people that are touching the customer? In the old days, you used to have, I know I used to work at Vista years ago. They used a, a phrase called one riot, one ranger, which just meant the same individual at the company prospected into the company, sold them the first thing, own cross sell, upsell, basically own that customer until somebody died or they left you. Um, that tends to be inefficient. Whereas if you break that job up into different functions, one, because that's a really expensive asset doing all these different jobs. If you break that up into, you know, SDRs, maybe doing the outbound prospecting and filling the funnel, maybe a closer who might be a hunter farmer, or maybe you split those two up, um, is doing the selling, as you'd say. Um, and then maybe customer success playing defense and focus on retention. Usually those folks are lower cost and by specializing, you're actually better at the job. You can actually tend to get both more bookings and lower costs. That's like one example. Two, as the, you know, the, the hack that you find all the time in business is technology. Um, there's, you know, I, I've seen companies before where salespeople are um, responsible for creating a lot of their own pipeline. Well, you know, do they have the right tools today? Do they have... Uh, sequencing tools like a, you know an outreach or a sales loft today. Like that tool, created, both of those and, and their competitors, uh, there's a ton of efficiency. I, I used to do my own prospecting. I have to track it all in Excel. It was a major headache keeping track of what I had sent to whom, when, and, and, and timing it. I mean, I didn't even worry about timing. I should have. Um, a tool like that is just almost like a personal trainer, making sure that seller's hitting, uh, hitting the right activity at the right times with the right people and helping you get um, customization and scale. So that's just like one example. So technology and specialization can help with uh, those costs. And then second, you know, I always like to try to figure out how did you end up with the structure you have today anyway? What does the annual planning look like? I'd say the, um, the simple but less efficient approach is people just, how do we finish last year? Okay, we've got 15 sellers. Seems like there's enough market out there. Maybe let's add three more heads and see how it goes. Um, you, there's a lot of companies that do that. What's much smarter is to take an outside in approach, try to size the market, how many customers and prospects are out there, segment appropriately. Again, you know, to your end, you know, to your point before, there might be you know, big whales, medium sized tunas, small guppies uh, out there that, in terms of customers that you, and prospects you would go chase. Line up the team appropriately, make sure you've got the right pipeline sources going into each of those, and then figure out your role definition. I find a lot of times there's a lot of efficiency there. Um, and then sometimes companies, you know, maybe don't have um, strategies, tools, and techniques lined up for cross-sell. Cross-sell in general tends to just be more efficient. It's easier. I mean, civilization has been 
uh, built on farming, right? Not hunting. Because hunting's hard. Farming, I'm not saying farming is easy, but it's easier than, than hunting for, for sustenance. Uh, same thing in business, right? You're calling the same person up. Your win rate, I think, is two and a half, I think, on average across all companies. Two and a half times as good going to an existing customer. You might already have the paperwork, MSA is in place. You know, it's easy to get them on the phone. So just uh, those would just be a couple examples of things you can do to, to un unlock some efficiency. Yeah, let, let's dive a little bit into the annual planning, especially when there are com complex environments with multiple business units and different sales targets. How actively are you connected to that piece of the business and and the planning that goes behind that on the sales side, on the marketing side? And then how much or how deeply do you look at the support required for the sales team, whether it's from a hunting standpoint or a farming standpoint, to be able to hit those projections. Like some of the things that we like to talk to our clients about is, well, you have your revenue quota, but if, as you start working backwards from that, it, it cascades into how many SQLs you need, how many MQLs you need, and ultimately how much budget you need to fund the programs that actually drive that pipeline in the first place. So how much work are you guys doing in that area? Yeah, I mean, it, it can be, I mean, sometimes you go to a company and you check the metrics and you look at historic performance and you realize, hey, we've got a leadership team that's pretty good at handling this. We're not going to force ourselves uh, on anybody on that front. Sometimes you find a team where they've got the horsepower, but maybe didn't have all the toolkits. Um, and, you know, that's you know, having nice Excel templates um, where somebody can really model out everything they're thinking of and do some scenario analysis that connects to those efficiency metrics so they can say, hey, if we took one seller off the field and replaced them with two BDRs, like what might that look like? And how's that gonna play out in terms of, you know, LTV to CAC or magic number, et cetera. Like we, can, we can provide the tools and some ideas. Sometimes they do that. And sometimes, you know, you've got a team, especially if you've got a change in leadership or maybe a vacant CRO or just um, a newer uh, CRO, CMO, where we wanna, we wanna develop them, we can actually go hand in hand with them on that plan. And, and you're absolutely right. Um, one, you want to figure out by all your, you want to figure out, first of all, the size of your market. So you start with some commercial due diligence. You want to segment it. And it's, that, that's always usually by how differently do these groups buy? People tend to buy the same. You want to put them in a, in a bucket if they buy differently or for different reasons, you put them in a separate segment. Each of those segments, uh, you want to be leveraging one, the amount of white space, greenfield there is out there. How much is there to go get? What's been our historic performance there? How often do we win? What's our right to win? Some of that's subjective and some of that hopefully is evidence-based. Um, then you can, with, with some good tools, you can model out what's the right number of sellers. You want to sanity check that in terms of, you know, based on the win rate that you've seen, um, how many opportunities they're going to need to run, are they going to have enough time? Again, do the right, right level of specialization. And then to your end, where's the pipeline coming from? And I've, and I've seen a lot of companies where that's an afterthought. And when it is an afterthought, it lands on the seller, right? If, if, I'm, a, if I'm a sales rep and, I'm in a, and you drop me in a territory and I don't get anything from marketing, I don't get anything from partner, I don't get anything from, from the BDRs, I still have a goal. Like my goal probably doesn't adjust accordingly. So sales teams and companies are doing themselves and sellers a disservice if they haven't thought carefully and aren't continually tracking how much pipeline they're giving to these salespeople. Salespeople have to get some of their own, right? And that's that's fine. But if you put some salesperson out, you know, it's, it's like you're sending a soldier out all on their own with a rifle um, with, with no support, it's probably not going to go well. Um, and I've seen uh, at, at big companies, big, big um, multi-hundred million dollar revenue companies that don't have that figured out and salespeople churn and that's expensive. How much of this work are you guys doing in, in commercial due diligence versus post-close, especially at the deal sizes that HG looks at? We know just from experience that the larger the deal is, the, the faster the deal almost needs to close because of the amount of co competition that's out there. So how much work are you doing during yeah. the diligence phase versus like actually once the company's in the portfolio? Yeah, I mean, there's different phases to it, right? The, and, I, and I'm not a, uh, an investment professional, so I don't know as much about that, that early part. But the long story short, they always have a very big funnel. They're looking at hundreds, thousands of companies, which they whittle out for different reasons, and some of that's proprietary. Um, but once you've got that, uh, once you're, you're now starting to dance, shall we say, with the company, um, maybe early on there might be uh, some interaction that we're doing with the investment professionals. 
you know, can we figure this out? We might hand a handful of questions that they might ask uh, in early stages. But assuming you get to a level where um, you're in the same ballpark in terms of what the enterprise value is going to be, there's usually a period of either exclusivity or they're opening up um, a level of uh, data. And then at that point, it's you want to ask for the right things. And maybe the company tracks all the things you want. Maybe they don't. Um, usually they don't track everything that you want. But you're able to go analyze that data, build some hypotheses out, and then usually you get a session where you can ask questions to to, uh, to quantify that. But um, it's like the you know there's an old Colin Powell uh, quote, which is you're never going to get to 100 percent certainty in terms of evidence. You if you do your homework, you're going to get to like 60 to 80 percent, and then you know uh, you can flesh out everything you can, you model out everything you can, but then something. Yeah. So and and when you're looking at as you get access to more and more data, one of the things that we found is that B2B companies, even if they're sophisticated, they might be doing 100 million in revenue, but as complexity increases, getting great data about all the different areas that you want to get information on is uh, sometimes even more challenging. And so how much of an effort are you putting into getting the right information out or setting up that baseline um, from a from a data standpoint? so that some of the other pillars of the business, like sales and marketing, can be focused on, on the right activities? Yeah, I want to make sure that I'm answering the, the question. So some of it's during due diligence. You know, we do outsource, and most private equity companies do outsource some commercial due diligence. And that's usually some, you know, 28-year-old McKinsey ninjas that are, um, you know, they're, they're crunching tons of data. They're doing a bunch of interviews. They're uh, taking assumptions and doing a top-down to size a market. And that usually helps you figure out how much is left to go get. Yeah. Sorry, I was going to say that's more like the TAM, SAM, and SOM type yeah. of stuff but, but, and segmentation. But I guess more on the revenue operations side, customer insight side, the customer base and the segmentation, the upsell, cross-sell opportunity. Um, how much uh, it, emphasis is there on data to get the right information out so that you're prioritizing the right, right activities and initiatives? Yeah, the the uh, I have found that some companies that are over a hundred million dollars don't have a good data set to work on. You do see it, um, and uh, so that's why you know companies like Dun and Bradstreet have done very well. Sometimes there's industry focused data sets that can give you a, um, a nice foundation. All of that said, though, that the the data set may not be the signals that you need. Um, Fortunately, there's no, no, when I used to work at Vista, the, they used to have a best practice where they would sometimes bring a bunch of interns in for the summer and just have them dialing for dollars, literally going down the list of companies calling in and asking key questions. You know, hey, what ERP system do you use? What, um, how many folks do you have doing this? How many different bank accounts do you, do you work with? Uh, and that's a hard way to go there. Uh, nowadays, the, there's some more AI tools, um, and we've got some proprietary tools at, uh, at HG that are data team, which is, they're pretty incredible, where they're very good at scraping um, uh, content uh, sources online and able to get us some answers that at scale that are pretty incredible. Then the key is how do you, how do you action that? It's one thing to hand a salesperson a, uh, you know, a CRM that has an account object that they can log into that maybe has 50 different data points, but there's a sales rep or even more so like a 24 or 23 year old BDR know how to action that data. Um, so it's really wise to, uh, at scale, distill that down to what's really important. Uh, and I would say that's how likely is, are they to buy and how big is the, what's the size of the prize if you get them. And that really helps you uh, prioritize a lot of things. Yeah, and doesn't product marketing or messaging and positioning and things like the, th that play a big role because enabling a rep like that at the front lines, they may have the data in terms of who they're going after, but what is the right messaging that they're putting out in front of the target customer? And, and is that aligned with what we want to say to those folks? So how much work is being done there to make sure it's, it's a uniform experience for the end customer? Yeah, I mean, there's uh, a lot of software companies and I'm, I'm, I'm gonna generalize here. Uh, you know, you have a charismatic founder who can go out and can sell a lot of times selling themselves, right? They, they go out, they've got all this industry experience, they get this vision for the company. It's like the book crossing the chasm. And you can win a lot, you can win those visionary customers that way, but it's really hard to scale. And the majority of customers are not going to buy that way. 
with the majority of customers, they one need to see how this is going to be connected to their business objectives. You know, it's not just going to be the person who's hands on keyboard with the, with the, you know, we're, we work in software, but you know, hands on whatever tool it is that you're selling. They're not there. It's got to connect to some kind of business need and business objective. They're going to want some proof that it works. Um, you're going to need some kind of a demo. You're going to have objection handlers. You're going to have competitors. Um, all of those things, very few salespeople are going to be able to come in without, without being given that and figure that out on the fly, right? That's a very low hit rate. So companies that don't enable their sales team with messaging, with training, with, with, with tools will tend to have a really high churn rate for salespeople and they'll be frustrated and whatnot. Usually companies get to a certain scale and they say, you know, it would be much more efficient than having one in 20 salespeople work is let's capture this information. Let's have the tools. Let's have a sales process. Let's have the right systems in place. And then now you just need somebody who can, you know, can learn those stories, use those tools and just is more responsible and hustles um, and good at, good at, good on their feet. You're going to have a much higher hit rate on salespeople. You're going to have a lower sales churn. You're going to see way more sellers get to 80%, get to 100% that way. So you are right. Some of that is what's the story and you need, you know, you need a 30 second, you need a 10 second version of it, a 30 second version, a two minute version, a 10 minute version, and you know, like a 30 minute version of your story for the different sales interactions you're going to have. And you're going to need an early version, which is get them excited about the problem, not really talk about the product. You can need a middle where you really talk about the product and you can need an end where you mitigate any kind of risks or hesitations that they yeah, you said something really interesting that we've experienced too. It's a lot of companies that we run into, we find that like, let's say they have a symptom of a missed quota or missed revenue projections. Well, one way to diagnose that is that, well, we just didn't have a good enough sales strategy, but it could be that you had a great strategy, but you didn't have enough marketing support. That's one possible answer. Another could be that you, you just didn't focus enough on readiness and readiness could mean so many different things, including training for the sales team, having the right content for different stages of the journey, educating and, and training those reps to have the right uh, conversations with the right segments of customers. And so we, we see that as a major gap that's, that's often missed. And then either projections get adjusted or there's churn on the sales team. And before you know it, you're now doing a reset altogether and the company's behind the eight ball in terms of projections for the next year. So what's your take on that? And, and have you seen that story play out as well in, in, in the portfolio? Yeah, I mean, I've seen uh, not necessarily at HG. Uh, this, you know, HG is my third private equity company that I've uh, that I've worked at, but doing a similar role. But I've seen all of the above, right? So sometimes you can have salespeople that have a good story, um, know how to sell, know how to run a sales process. But if you just don't get them enough pipeline, um, they're they're you know they're not going to hit their goal. Like some, at some point, pipeline becomes your jet your destiny in the short term. You know, if you've got a team that wins one in four deals. Right. By dollar, you need 4x pipeline to hit. Second, like you said, you might be able to get in front of the right customers, but if you don't have your messaging right, and, the, and, and, maybe, and your messaging has to appeal to everybody who needs to say yes, and has to at least mitigate everybody who can say no in a deal. So those complex deals, those bigger, uh, those bigger opportunities, they're going to land in front of a CFO or some finance person who's not a technical person, who's not using the tool, who does not care about UX, UI. Right? They're going to need to understand what the business rationale is, and then they're going to prioritize it against the other places they're trying to spend money because, because money's finite, Band, bandwidth is finite. Um, so, so that's an, so sometimes it's pipeline, sometimes it's the story, sometimes it's execution. You know, you may have salespeople that um, nobody ever taught them how to sell. They were hired, they brought in, you know, maybe somebody just gave them a pitch deck, or they said, "Listen to Gary, pitch, do like him." And people, need, you need to tell people. Um, uh, and teach people how, how to sell. And you need good manager coaching. So it can fall apart any one of those places. Or, you know, you can have a change in the product uh, market dynamic, right? There could be, uh, you know, another player has come in with a Me Too product and is undercutting you on price. Um, you could have, a you know, another paradigm shift, right, uh, in the market. It could be the, you, know, you need different integrations or you need, you need different um, features are important to customers today, whatever that is. So, um, you always want to take a holistic view. Uh, it's very easy to fire a sales leader, right? So, and, and a lot of people do. I think the average tenure for uh, a VP of sales or chief, chief revenue officer is 18 months. Um, and I think part of it is when sales fall, people hope that's the problem. 
because that's a that's a quick fix, right? If it's something else, but what I would recommend is if you've missed numbers, do a full diagnostic uh, from product market fit to pipeline uh, through to closing to you know look at your look at your install base for reference ability to make sure that's the problem before you just throw somebody over. Totally. We've seen this on the marketing side too. The tenure of a VP of marketing is, or CMO is like 17 months. So if you look at those two critical roles on the go-to-market side and they're, they're churning in less than two years in, in most B2B companies, well, how much continuity can you have? How much institutional memory can you have? How much progress can you really make if that role keeps changing and you keep resetting the strategy? So uh, fully agree. And then on the diagnostic side, um, everything that you said resonated. We, we've seen that on the marketing side as well, where, yeah, you 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 may have uh, a, an aggressive target and it may turn out that you just don't have enough budget for your go-to-market plan to be able to hit those numbers. And oftentimes we find that uh, firms are doing like a bottom or top-down forecast where it's a financial model. You look You look at it on a spreadsheet, you look at new bookings or new logos, cross-sell, upsell, expansion, et cetera. And through that, you get to kind of where you want to grow to. But we don't see it enough that there's a bottom-up forecast where you're really looking at all the different dials that grow into go into driving the numbers in each of those different uh, growth areas. And marketing is a part of that. Sales is part of that. Customer success is a part of that. And it could be product and pricing and other things that are part of that as well that, that affect our ability to hit those numbers. So... Uh, definitely agree on the full diagnostic. Um, in terms of HG, like how how much do you factor in some of those bottom up dials and 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 levers before you decide what a realistic target would be? On the marketing side, uh, let's say you're looking at a company and let's say that pipeline is insufficient. Yeah, you're, you're going to want to do a couple of things. One, you're going to want to do a roaming analysis. Just say, okay, based on budget that we have today, what are the different tactics that are used, what are the different segments, et cetera, what's been the return? Ideally, you find some kind of opportunity to rebalance uh, because you know, that would be budget neutral, maybe budget beneficial. Um, if you talk about adding additional budget, um, you're right, but it's uh, in marketing, it's harder to just assume, hey, if we spend 50% more budget in this channel, are we going to get 50% more leads and are those leads going to keep converting at the same rate? Uh, so there is some science to it and some math to it, but then you know, a good CMO is going to be able to size up the situation, apply the correct tactics. They're going to be able to give you an estimate for what it's going to take to get there. And then you're going to want to work in concert with leadership, strategy, and finance to figure out, is that worth it for you? Um, and and so, sometimes it's, it requires a rethink, right? I've seen before where a lead is not just a lead. Sometimes there's certain businesses where you need to win in a window of time. And you might actually need to catch customers, not just the right profile, but the right time. That's like that intent data that you'd see, from like a sixth sense or like a trigger.ai. Um, so you just want to make sure that, that, that the tactics that you use um, fit. And, and there's other times where, hey, maybe there's like a partner we need um, that is going to know when the customer's in a place where they want to buy, especially if you're part of a, if you're selling, let's say, some software that tends to happen during a broader um, uh, broader tech refresh, like an ERP refresh. Well, you're going to want to, you're going to need to know when these ERP refreshes are happening. So you need some kind of, some kind of data that you might be able to get from a, a trigger online, or maybe you're going to need to, you know, to be working with, a, with an SAP or maybe a, a consultant that, that handles those transformations, et cetera. So you got to, you got to figure out what the tactic is and make sure that it makes sense given the business. Totally. And then ultimately it kind of comes to like an investment committee decision, right? You're looking at potentially more of an investment in marketing or sales, or you maybe you need more territory coverage or you need more farmers on the, on, on the upsell cross sell side. And then you're kind of making a decision across the portfolio to decide if that's an area where you want to invest or, or it's something else that's going to give you a higher ROI at the board level. Yeah. I think one thing that's great about working with HG is Unlike some other PE companies, we don't force um, best practices down on the companies. So it's a collaborative approach. You're bringing the functional experts in, we eyeball um, and size up and do diligence on the company and come back and say, okay, based on our experience, this is what we've seen work elsewhere. Uh, but you know, any given company, we might come back with 12 levers that we could pull. Um, now, a, a good CEO uh, that we're gonna partner with is probably gonna look at those, those 12 and maybe say, out of those maybe three I don't want to do right now, let's maybe wait a year. 
these other three. I think I've got folks in-house that can handle this, maybe with a little guidance, maybe they've got the tools today, they just need the time, okay? But those these final six, we could really use your help for, let's do them in this order. And we'll, we'll, we'll work with leaders to do that. Because again, they're, they work in that business every day. I mean, I've been on the... I've been on the operator side. You know, when you're, it's it's great to get best practice and leverage from the outside, but you know, somebody who's who's popping in from time to time isn't living in the business every day. So we definitely respect the um, the, the expertise and the knowledge people have from going to battle every day. From living and breathing it every day, totally. And so to that yeah. to that end, like how much time is spent on getting the right leaders and the right seats in the business and. How do you go about that? And which areas do you normally focus on when you're when you're looking at bringing in uh, executive level talent into these companies? Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, our, our bias is towards the existing team, right? You, uh, because again, they've got the they've got the knowledge. But sometimes it's not the right leader. Sometimes the uh, the person that gets you from you know from zero to ten million in revenue is a very different profile from the person that gets you from ten to hundred. You know, Mark Mark Beanie offs don't grow on trees. I think he's See the only he might be the only founder that has got to take a take a company to one, the size one of the only few ones, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, there's not many. There's not, I'm probably missing a couple, but there's not many of them. Uh, the, so when you have to when you have to make that change, uh, one we always want to work with the with the CEO with the board, um, and then uh, we've got a talent team in house that's very good at this, and I, I don't want to uh, speak for them too much, but I know a lot of the process is. Figure out what is the job that needs to be done, you know, because sometimes you're bringing in a leader and you're realizing, hey, look, we've made a bunch of acquisitions before, for example, um, uh, but we really haven't integrated them. So we need somebody who's really good at integrating different businesses and, and distilling that, and harmonizing that. Well, on the other hand, you might have to say, hey, look, if we're we've gone direct to uh, and gotten to sixty million dollars, if we're going to get to two hundred million, we're really going to need a partner motion. Let's get a let's bring in a CEO who either has some of the relationships we need or has the experience building out uh, you know, a partner-led business. Those are just two examples, but it, the point being working backwards from the job that needs to be done um, and then using that to get the profile and get some good candidates and then making sure that they, that they mesh. And you always have to watch out for the, uh, the talented a-hole problem, right? There's, they've got to work with the other leaders. So uh, <laughs> they're always very careful to, uh, to screen for any kind of uh, personality issues. That's great. Okay. Well, I, I think that's a good place yeah. to, to end the episode, but b- before we wrap up, just what, what is a, what are, were a couple of books that you recommend either to your portfolio CEOs or they, for the audience that you would recommend that as people are looking at sales readiness or, or, or trying to scale their companies or their uh, respect, respective portfolio companies, what would you recommend for them to read? Yes. Yeah, so for broader business, uh, I love it. I think it's called seven secrets of high growth companies. Uh, and it just, uh, it was this long longitudinal study of companies that outperformed their peers for multiple decades. Uh, a lot of great lessons in there, like, you know, at the top of the company, have an inside leader and an outside leader as separate roles. Uh, that's, that's one example. I really like that business. Um, in, uh, in sales and marketing, which is more uh, my domain, obviously a big fan of the, the Challenger books, Challenger Sale, Challenger Customer. I think uh, very useful books. I think... Um, if you if you're trying to prospect for business, um, uh, Jeb Blout's books are fantastic. I've, I've got uh, two sisters that are in sales; they both have copies of that um, on their desk. And um, uh, right now, I'm, I'm reading High Tech Sales, which is a great book to kind of yeah, it just frames up what your tech stack should look like and helps you uh, prioritize and budget accordingly. So I'd say those are three. I mean, there's there's so many so many that I love. And then on the talent front, you said uh, the book Who I think is is fantastic. That's that's one thing that I was citing with in terms of hire for the job that needs to be done. Yeah, yeah those are great uh, great book recommendations. I fully 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 support all of those. So um, yeah, we'll be sure to put those in the show notes. And if people want to learn more, we'll be sure to link out to the HG website and, and ways to connect with you as well. But thanks for doing this, Matt. This was a phenomenal interview. So uh, so thanks for taking the time. Thank you. Thanks for the time, Shiv. 
Thanks for listening to today's episode. Before you take off, just a few requests from our side. Number one, if you enjoyed today's content and want more of it, please subscribe to the podcast on your favorite podcatcher. Number two, if you are in the market for marketing strategy consulting services, due diligence services, or fractional CMO services, please visit our website at www.howtosass.com and schedule a consult today. And number three, if you haven't already, grab a copy of my book, Post Acquisition Marketing. It's available on Apple Books, on Amazon, and any bookstore that you can find online. Get a copy because it walks through the framework that we take all of our clients through and it'll definitely add value to your business. And that's it for today. We'll see you guys next time.